So even when we thought we could get inventory, we couldn't. So that when we started ramping back up too, you know, there was just that communication of what was ordered, what did we have, what was coming, how soon was it coming, but all the while, let's keep doing surgery. Rising above the buzz of ultrasonic cleaners and the clanking of stainless steel are the ideas and voices that are changing an industry. You're listening to the Beyond Clean Podcast, the central nexus for the people, processes, and products that are improving our sterile processing world. Each week, we speak with frontline technicians, CEOs, engineers, and entrepreneurs with a common goal to help you fight dirty every instrument, every time. Whether you are tuning in for education or inspiration, we're glad you did. Now turn on those washers and turn up the volume. It's time to go beyond clean. On this episode of Beyond Clean, we speak with Fran Strauss, Clinical Director of Perioperative Services at Penn Medicine Pennsylvania Hospital, and Mark Graben, Senior Advisor with Value Capture. He's also an author, a speaker, and a podcaster, so we're going to be talking a little bit about that today. But ultimately, they collaborated on a big project to launch off-site reprocessing. We're going to hear a lot about those lessons learned and really some of the statistics that they're going to share with us today, Hank are really profound, but even more so, there's a message in here about whether it's offsite reprocessing or just making changes in your current practices, learning how to solve those problems from within versus looking for solutions outside of the organization is absolutely the place to start. It's something we're going to be woven into the conversation today. Yeah, if you've ever kind of been trying to look around for benchmarks, for instance, we're going to make a very small but very important kind of throw out to that benchmark conversation that I think will be worth your entire time. But in general, this topic is so hot, the offsite. I mean, a lot of folks are going to be tuning in because they're either already doing this, they've been thinking about doing it. And we're going to be talking about today to some folks who have done it and have done it successfully and learned a lot of things along the way. So, Stay tuned. It's going to be a great combo. All right. We'll be right back after a short break with Mark and Fran. I'm Justin Poulin. And I'm Hank Balch. From 17 Studios, you're listening to Beyond Clean, the global voice of sterile processing. Joining us now is Fran Strauss, Clinical Director of Perioperative Services at Penn Medicine Pennsylvania Hospital, and Mark Graben, Senior Advisor with Value Capture, author, speaker, and a fellow podcaster. So make sure you go find his podcast after you listen to this one, if you haven't found him already. And we're going to be talking about leveraging data and collaborating with central sterile processing. Safety in numbers, Hank, is what you called this one. Fran, thanks so much for coming on the show. Sure. Thank you for having me. And Mark, you as well. I'm expecting a really smooth radio voice answer to this welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a yeah. I mean, anybody can podcast, right? So I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna try to turn that on a little bit, but no, I, I'm gonna stammer my way through answers here, just the way I would stammer through questions as a podcaster. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. It's a totally different experience being on the other side, right? Like I don't, I'm the one doing most of the interviewing these days. I get on a couple of interviews here and there, but um, it is really a completely different experience. Mark, let's start with you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and and maybe even the story of how you got into podcasting? Well, so maybe first on the podcasting thing, you know, I started podcasting back in 2006 with uh, a podcast it's badly named, awkwardly named. It's called Lean Blog Interviews because I'd started a blog called Lean Blog and the podcast was an extension of that. So in that podcast, I interview you know, people from different industries, leaders, authors, you know, people like that. And then during the pandemic, I started another podcast for the firm Value Capture. It's a podcast called Habitual Excellence, where we talk to healthcare leaders, people like Fran and others others doing um, great improvement work. And then a third podcast I'll mention is another pandemic project, a personal one called My Favorite Mistake. 
where we talk about learning from mistakes, you know, as, as professionals and as organizations. So that's the podcast. But, you know, quickly about my background, it, it's been fun collaborating with Fran because we have very different backgrounds. I'm an industrial engineer. The two other people from Value Capture who worked with Fran were another industrial engineer and a nurse. So we'll talk more about collaboration and combining, you know, our, our knowledge and experience. I started my career um, 10 years in manufacturing, took a bit of a detour into healthcare in 2005. And, you know, I've been you know, really happy to work with healthcare organizations since then, you know, bringing in ideas from engineering and leadership and lean and working together with leaders to try to improve operations and, and change the culture. So that's kind of the long story short of how I got to be at Value Capture and how we ended up there working with Pennsylvania Hospital. And friend, I know this is your first podcast, but who knows? You might like it enough uh, to start your own, <laughs> do your own here moving forward. Tell us a little bit about yourself. And then in that kind of paint a backdrop to the conversation that we're going to have today, this big project that brought everyone together. Sure. So my background has been always in the operating room area. So for over 35 years, hard to believe, but have worked in and around perioperative services, kind of grew up in the operating room, learning to scrub and circulate it, and then just continued to advance, similar to Mark, just learning, constant learning, right? Lifelong learning, just continued to advance, took a leadership track, and have been the clinical director at Pennsylvania Hospital for almost six years now. And as I entered Pennsylvania Hospital, had many opportunities to make improvements and Probably the most recent improvement was our sterile processing department. So we entered an agreement, and this is kind of the backdrop for this entire project, and we invested in a property that would house our off-site reprocessing center. And from that investment that Pencil Pen Medicine made, you know, we really began to learn many things about our own internal processes. So as we began to work through that transition to the ISC, it also caused us to really reflect on issues in our own processing department. So as I had been the clinical director for perioperative services, I quickly focused much of my energy and time in the sterile processing department to gain insight and understand our current state and how that worked with the ISC. So really the focus though was internally in our in our own sterile processing department. And by ISC, I just want to make sure that I understand is that integrated service center? Is that nope. Um, good, guess. good catch there. It's <laughs> called the Interventional Support Center. Okay. Well, there you wasn't go. too far off, but yeah. yeah. We know, I mean, there is probably not a hotter topic in the industry today than off-site and the whole kind of centralization conversation. I mean, it is everywhere. It's in the water. All all these manufacturers are thinking about it, and talking about it. All the users are considering it as these systems continue to get bigger and or get smaller in certain scenarios. We got all this volume going out to ambulatory surgery that have their own challenges. I mean, this is this is the epicenter of what's going on in SPD today. So it's it's really great to talk to someone who has just gone through the process or, or is continuing to go through the process to flesh out some lessons learned. So let's just kind of start on some of the challenges because I think that's where conversations start is it's a scary conversation to have. Like you're you're taking my stuff somewhere else on the clinician side <laughs> and then everything else that kind of waterfalls from that. So Fran, like maybe you can kind of start in the initial conversations because you've been there kind of through the whole process, the conversation, the build up, the planning, the execution. What were those challenges and roadblocks that kind of came up in discussion or that you knew going into this that you're going to have to try to find a way to overcome? So I think one of the biggest things, as you mentioned, Hank, was really a degree of trust. You know, we really stripped the entire trust and trustworthiness of our service to our stakeholders, our key stakeholders who were our surgeons. So in hindsight, I think one of the challenges 
obviously was to regain that trust and confidence that they could expect a reliable product, right? So they could have the right item at the right time for the right patient. And that could be met consistently. I think that the other thing that from just a challenge was really to build confidence, you know, in the team as well, you know, so really in the sterile processing techs, establishing a smoother operation for them, better morale overall, and a better communication. So better communication with them about processes, changes in process, and as well as communicating abroad, you know, with that interventional support center or offsite reprocessing. And I think the other challenge we had was initially when we did move in this transition to this transition, immediately the response was bring it all back, bring everything back. And I know that our senior executive team, it was difficult, but they really kind of held the line. And that's where I think then we began to recognize more of our roadblocks, more of our challenges. We did, however, bring a lot of our orthopedic sets back. And part of that was one of the challenges we had in not having enough inventory, right? And frequently seeing quality defects in the finished product. So, you know, making sure that we had that quality and safety and it was easier to be on site than 30 miles away. You know, when they said bring it all back, I definitely hear you talking about kind of the orthopedic trays and that whole loaner consignment world, right? We've got some work to do just in the way that we connect back with the manufacturers. And you've got a high degree of variability because you have some that are in 1099 situations with less support structures and some that are direct reps in that world. You know, so I, I, I think you'll still be successful on that. It's just, it's one of those things that there's some, there's some variability there that's tough to control. And I, I do know that there are, processes and initiatives in the industry moving forward that's going to smooth out some of those bumps, I think, and it'll definitely be capable. But I wonder, is it physician preference that caused that bring it all back as kind of one of the major things initially? Like, you probably planned for that and worked through that, but, you know, I'm a nurse. I've worked in the clinical setting, and I can just kind of see how it's like I've lost control, And I'm really worried about this moment in the day. And so there's kind of like a knee jerk that would naturally, I would expect would naturally happen, especially with a large organization. Was it physician preference or was there something else that was really at the core of that from the experience, you know, of that loss of control? Well, I think, and Mark, you can probably speak to a lot of this because I think we spent a lot of time learning and having interviews with key stakeholders too. And some of those key stakeholders did include our surgeons. So I want to give Mark the opportunity to share that experience. But I think that it was really a matter of having what they needed in-house at the time they needed it, recognizing that without the proper inventory, you know, we weren't always able to have something available for them and would cause delays or even cancellations. Yeah. And when Value Capture got the call to, to come in and help Pennsylvania Medicine with this, you know, I had worked with the ASC back in 2019. And that project, different aim, different focus, you know, had had gone well. And so, you know, the director of process improvement reached out and we started having this conversation. And even before we came on site, I mean, the first, first part of the discussion was us asking questions. You know, we try to work with clients to make sure, first off, do we really understand the situation and the problem and the needs well enough to even consider solutions. You know, we're, we're not the type of consultant that comes in and writes a report and dumps it on you and leaves or a consultant that comes in and says, you know, well, here's 42 best practices and you just need to implement these. And, you know, cause, cause we know, you know, our style is to come in and to be collaborative advisors. And so that meant, you know, talking to, to leaders like Fran, that meant meetings with the chiefs of different surgical departments, other senior executives, some other key physicians to hear their perspectives and their perceptions and their needs. And, you know, we, we, we talked with frontline staff and you know, we were trying to emphasize we need to come up together with solutions that are going to meet the needs of all stakeholders, 
not the needs of the patients at the expense of the surgeons. Like we want there to be good alignment there. We're going to come up with better processes that would provide better service to the surgeons and the patients as the customer, but also create a better working environment for the team and for the staff. And, you know, those were, I think, goals that we all had alignment on and, um, you know, kind of understanding people's experiences, people's feelings, and then trying to go find data, right? We were trying to quantify how would we quantify the current state of performance? What is the desired state of performance? And then from that, kind of set the goals for how are we going to evaluate if this is a success or not? You know, Mark, I said earlier that the offsite conversation is one of the hottest topics in the industry. I'd say probably data is a close number two, if not number one. <laughs> and as you know, and and I've probably experienced, I'm assuming through this project, just saying, hey, let's look at the data is actually not step one. It's, oh, let's see how dirty this data is. <laughs> and then get a plan for cleaning the data up. So we actually have something to your point that is usable for us to even look at, like, what is that future state? So I have my own answer to this, but I'm kind of curious what you say. What is the big deal with dirty data? Why is it so dangerous in projects like this in terms of planning and execution and, and even, you know, patient safety? Well, I think, I mean, and this is a widespread problem that, you know, this was not a uniquely pen medicine kind of issue. There, there's, uh, you know, a lot of operational data performance metrics where it's either, like you said, dirty, where you have to step back and say, okay, well, how, how, how accurate? What, what's, what's the integrity of the data? Is this data that is captured electronically or manually? Is it sampled at different points in the day or is it being measured continuously? I mean, you know, even, even if data is collected automatically, there still could be holes in how it's being measured. Let's say, for example, like if an emergency department for a different setting measures door to dock time. Well, okay, there's data collected electronically for every patient, but the, the quote unquote door time is really the time of the first interaction with somebody with a computer, right? We don't, you know, you may not really know the time that they actually literally walk through the door. So the data can be messy or, or inaccurate. And, and then there's times where I don't know if you would say the data is clean because the data is not there and you have to go out. And we did this in some cases to go and manually collect some data. If one of the key questions about the flow of instruments was, well, how long does it take? What's the elapsed time from when instruments are done in the operating room and they're brought out and brought down and go through all the steps of SPD and get reassembled and prepared for the OR? How long does that take? We had to go collect data but the, the, the other thing I would add about that is working with a team of people from Pennsylvania Hospital. You know, we had a cross-functional team of two people from SPD, two people from the OR. The other value captured team members and I taught them how to collect data, how to observe the flow. So we had a baseline. We could analyze that baseline and set a, a, a reasonable prediction and a goal of how much we could bring that flow time down. And then, you know, go after it. And then again, have to collect some data manually afterward and, and, you know, have everyone vouch for it, that this is representative, that this is accurate, that the before and after is apples to apples. So we could show that reduction in how long it took to get through SPD. Mm -hmm. Well, and I can imagine that it had some positive insights in terms of right-sizing the inventory as well, which is something I kind of heard in what you said too, Fran, as, you know, kind of a potential, sort of opportunity of understanding so that you had everything that needed to be made available. And sometimes, you know, we'll often find that the inventory is not there, that we increase the caseload and the procedures, but we didn't increase the inventory to match what we were trying to drive, which is additional revenue. Then, of course, the pandemic kind of threw everything <laughs> for a loop on that because one one minute we're not doing anything and now everybody wants us to increase 20% above of what we did before to get to this backlog. And so that creates additional strain. And, and honestly, I think a lot of places, because revenues were so tight, even if they wanted to go to above 20%, it's coming up with the capital to increase the inventory 
to meet that when there was already maybe somewhat of a shortage of inventory to begin with. So, you know, I kind of want to talk about projects of this size and scale because I feel like, you know, the benefits of, a, of, of setting this up are, are huge. Like once it's running, you know, I actually think it could increase inventory availability, right? Because you have shared inventory. It can increase consistency. It can increase training and standardization, you know, for the people that are doing the job. There's so many positive implications, which is why, Hank, I think it is such a popular topic. But not just for this kind of a project, but really for projects of this scale and magnitude, especially in a, in a department that typically does, is under, under, uh, sourced in terms of technology, right? So going back to the data, part of the reason we can't capture all of that is because sterile processing departments in general across the country struggle with the same thing because they may not have technologies that really effectively do this. And there is so much that's still relied upon on the human side of it. When you look at projects this scale, what are some common mistakes? They might not have even necessarily been faced in this situation, but Fran, you can kind of speak to this a little bit first. And then Mark, please add on. You know, but, and, and maybe there's mistakes as you did research that others told you about that you didn't even face, but there were things that you were prepared to face because they're common mistakes in large scale projects. What are those? Well, I think one of the biggest mistakes is having good communication. So I think right off the bat, understanding and being able to recognize and learn what the problem is before you jump to solutions was also something that, you know, we worked together to really decompress. So really with the team, you know, even the team members were working, you know, one sterile processing tech with one OR person so that together they combined to really understand because each came from a different background and understood the, the, the problems differently and approached them differently in just their mindset. And so I think, Mark, you mentioned about how we really had to work with the team so that we could learn, really. And we took that time to learn. And I think the other thing that, you know, we recognized is just a level of communication that we needed from the very beginning. And so you mentioned the pandemic. We were really impacted by that. So, you know, we had a lot of our orders in place, but then the pandemic hit and then everything stopped. So even when we thought we could get inventory, we couldn't. So that when we started ramping back up too, you know, there was just that communication of what was ordered, what did we have, what was coming, how soon was it coming, but all the while, let's keep doing surgery and let's keep doing with, you know, the, the what we have. And that wasn't always substantial enough to have a high level performance. That must have been such a challenge. I mean, you know, you're doing what you were doing was a transformation that was very disruptive, right? But for a, in a positive way. But then you had probably one of the biggest disruptions in healthcare that's come along, maybe ever, disrupting your disruptive process. I can't even imagine that double whammy, Mark. If you if you want to kind of, I know you're about to add on to what Fran had to say, but what interesting timing for you all. Well, I mean, uh, you know, when we started this. In February of this year, I mean, you know, we're still traveling with masks on and still wearing masks at work and still submitting, you know, every morning that we haven't tested positive for COVID. But, you know, we started to feel like, all right, this is part of the recovery from peak COVID times. Let's start getting back to normal. And, you know, people uh, get tired of hearing the phrase new normal. You know, I think we were trying to establish some, some new normals within, you know, the realm we were working in here. And, and one of those new normals, again, is, you know, kind of just uh, improved communication, not just for the project, but for day-to-day -day operations and breaking down silos. As Fran mentioned, you know, you have people who know their work really well. They know their area. And given the opportunity to learn, you know, the kind of the broader workflows around your work, I mean, that's so powerful you know, to just to, you know, emphasize this team that we had, there was, there was the team, meaning, you know, everybody who works in OR and SPD. And we would talk about like, let, let, we, we were going to work as one team that supports each other. And then we had this dedicated project team. You know, we had four people for about three months, like this was their full-time assignment to spend time working with us as advisors from Value Capture not just collecting data, but observing 
the process and what really happens and to watch it you know through that entire loop was really eye opening and then those dedicated team members had their relationships with everyone else in the departments where again it wasn't just the four of them and Fran and a couple other supervisors and the value capture people it wasn't us working on an island you know they were sharing what they learned with their colleagues they were getting input when it came down to understanding the problem and then to start talking about improvements to implement you know we zeroed in as a team you know that that improving flow through tray assembly meant among other things changing the physical layout of the room and that was just an opportunity that had never been given to people to to really step back and say what should the layout be as it happens in a lot of departments and a lot of organizations nobody knows the history of like well why is the room laid out this way at some point it just happened and it evolved and once people step back and look at it they're like well no this isn't how we would do it if we were given the chance to try you know from kind of literally a blank sheet of paper of like what's the physical layout that supports flow and makes work easier for people and makes the instruments flow better so, right so it's not working faster it's preventing and eliminating delays that happen in between the steps of instrument processing and we help the team see that and they really embrace those learnings and said okay let's figure out how to do things better i know this is not the thrust of those comments but i just want to throw this out here because you made me think about it i'm a huge fan at least in these in the assembly side it's, it's a little harder on the decontamination side even like sterilization cuz it's so tied to equipment but in assembly if you can build those departments with some flexibility in order to be able to compensate for, hey, if we get a new washer over here or if we change something else over here that needs to impact that flow, like what you're talking about, that you can move the tables around. Like, I can't tell you how many departments are like who are built is like this flow ain't moving because <laughs> there's a wall here. There's a column here. Like there's a plug here. You can't go anywhere else. And it it really hurts that ability to look at and know, oh, man, if we just move these things out, like we could save all this time, all this frustration, like running into each other. There's all those little things that if if we plan a little more proactively and creatively on the architectural side, on the design side, it can give us freedom to improve. So that's a great point. I know we've been talking about collaboration, Fran, but I want to throw over kind of where are we today kind of question because we started with challenges and roadblocks with you. Like, What's the background for this? How did we navigate through the challenges of data? How did we navigate through the challenges of communication that you mentioned? But I know that even though the project is complete or near completion, the process of improving is continual, uh, right? We never arrive. But kind of snapshot today, like where are you in terms of those goals that you set out at the beginning? And what are some highlights that you're kind of proud about? Well, I think one of the things that I'm most proud about is the staff's engagement. So while we engage them in the redesign and then, you know, the consistency of trying to, you know, shape and mold the behaviors around the physical environment changes, I think what I'm most proud is of how we've assessed their level of satisfaction. So we did a survey before we even engaged in this process to include not only the operating room, but also our physician colleagues, as well as the sterile processing and morale really was at an all time low, you know, but we, we've gotten quotes from people where they feel like it's less chaotic, that, you know, the feelings aren't overwhelming. One of the leaders in the operating room said that his office was like a revolving door where surgeons would come in there consistently and now it's not like that anymore. We've been actually able, through this physical redesign, able to be consistent in the number of sets that we've seen in assembly. We've actually seen a 93% reduction in the number of trays that are waiting for assembly. So not only did our physical environment change, 
but the behaviors associated. We removed probably over a dozen racks where instruments would routinely get moved out of the washer and right on those racks. Yeah, the staging area, right? Right, right. right. We're not getting to those for a couple of days area. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> the problem is everybody starts picking off of them. So then well, when the tray goes to assembly, it doesn't have anything. <laughs> Correct. That's exactly right. You know, we've been consistently coming in in the morning with probably less than a dozen sets sitting, you know, waiting to be assembled. So that was really incredible. I know that Mark mentioned just the flow of an instrument tray. So we observed at the very beginning of this project a set taking about 10.6 hours, 10, 10 hours, let's just say. We've, we've been able to get that narrowed down to three, 3.6 hours. So we shaved seven hours off that whole throughput. It's, it's incredible. And, and you can just see in the staff just a re-energy, re-energize. They're just, they're just so much more engaged. They see the difference. And now I feel like they see what impact their work has on the customer. And that's really why we looked at this. I mean, yeah, no one wants to come into work and feel hopeless, feel like you're you're just never going to dig out. And that morale issue that you're talking about, I mean, it has all those implications for like recruiting, retaining employees, the whole career progression. If you've got a place like that that you feel good about coming into and proud about the process and the flow and the quality, I mean, it's a it's a tremendous game changer. Mark, you're about to say yeah. something too. Well, you know, part of feeling good about your work is you know the positive feedback about the service that's being provided to the ORs, but also making it easier to do the right work in a high quality way, right? So we observed people working in the departments. And, you know, this is sensitive. You have to, and this is where the team members who have good relationships make this less threatening than if it was, you know, some outside consultants coming in, but you're observing people and how they work, not to judge them, but to look for interruptions to their work, right? So you notice things like, well, and start asking questions like, well, why are you having the interrupt tray assembly to go walking around restocking your own workbench with supplies, and why is every workbench different? And can we agree on standardizing the setup and, you know, trying to, uh, you know, set up supplies and materials so that people, you know, can focus on their work? And, you know, that, that that's the one great thing about it's counterintuitive, maybe with the lean methodology. But when you identify the sources of waste, where that means interruptions to people's work, the interruptions to flow, you start challenging things like, well, why, why are carts accumulating in front of the elevator on the eighth floor? Why are they not flowing down to decontamination more quickly? You know, when you identify those systemic causes of waste, people aren't having to work faster. They can dedicate more time to working on more trays and not being rushed, right? So there's a quality component. And we were trying to measure quality in different ways, starting at the OR, like the percentage of time that instruments and trays arrive down in decontamination being sort of like properly prepped, right? So this is part of the communication and collaboration of helping the OR understand like not just what to do, but why of like, if they don't properly clean the instruments in the OR, how it makes it so much harder downstream and you know, you know, help us help you kind of conversations. And, you know, people want to do good work, but sometimes people don't know the impact of skipping a step. And, you know, kind of this teamwork and collaboration opens people's eyes to things like that. You, you really hit my, one of my very favorite themes, which is that point of use cleaning. And, you know, it's just something that can never be emphasized enough. We've had some interviews where we've talked about the fact that that data isn't collected. Like we'll collect you know, when with data on when an instrument with bio burden hits the operating room, but we're not necessarily collecting data on when bio burden that should have been removed, at least gross soil 
speaking, you know, before it gets to decontam. And we don't collect that data and we don't connect how they're integrated. And I'm thinking back to an episode that we did earlier this season with Garrett Hollenbeek. And we talked about, you know, the different types of workers. And you really just made a point about quality that ties back to the first episode of this season that there are just some people that are better suited to do production and others that are better suited to focus on quality and kind of fitting those pieces together. And I can see where, again, having a centralized scenario like this allows you to put those pieces together a lot easier than, um, than many different disparate departments and, and the mix of employees, you know, might just be difficult to achieve, especially in those smaller departments. But, you know, as we kind of wrap up, I know we're getting close here. But I guess I would ask, you know, we love to just kind of put some practical steps out there or practical action items that when we wrap up the interview, we can throw that out there. And, you know, obviously the project that the two of you worked on together was a very large project that takes a lot of planning, that takes a lot, but you probably learned some lessons, you know, about how you could have even have done things before the project differently. And and I wonder, what are some practical things that you could put, maybe one or two, that you could put in front of the audience that they could really take away from your experience and, and just improve their day-to-day lives today, you know, and, and put it into action? Either one of you can go first. I, I think I'll, I'll go first. I mean, there, there, there's so many lessons and, you know, kind of points that reinforce that there are systemic problems in healthcare, you could say systemic problems across, you know, the OR SPD flow, because those problems don't just exist in one organization. Last week, I was, I had opportunity to go to Brazil to do some teaching and I visited a hospital in an ST, SPD department and similar situation. They had lots of racks that instruments were sitting on. They were missing performance measures and having trouble with data and communication. It's the, by definition a systemic problem if you tend to you know, see it. It's just part of the healthcare system. But the, you know, I think the other great thing though is these things are fixable, and you know it means doing the work of you know. Here, here, here's the tip. I'll state what I said earlier, a bit you know, a bit differently. A lot of organizations when they want to improve, they look for solutions. And they'll even travel the country, if not traveling the world, visiting and benchmarking and learning. And you can invest the the time and effort or maybe even less time and effort in studying your own work in your organization, talking to your team, and you can figure it out. And and, and that's often a better solution than an off-the-shelf best practice. And and here's, here's the key thing. It's going to be more deeply embraced by the people doing the work and the leaders and the supervisors and the managers and all, they're going to embrace it and own it when they develop that solution, maybe with the help of an outside advisor. But that's probably 90% of the battle toward quote unquote sustainment. I love that. I love that. Fran, what about you? What kind of takeaway would you say, would you want folks listening to this episode be able to implement tomorrow? Just the importance of engaging the team and communicating. I think for for me in this project and in this work, I've learned so much about what it means to really learn and to observe, to understand what is important to the customer and how important it is that we engage the team in making change, designing the change and working through process. And I think, you know, data is great. But how we talk about it, how we present it, how it's transparent to the staff, it makes it much more meaningful and it further engages the team to want to do the best work possible. Yeah, that's a real key to change management. There's no doubt. That was a significant change you went through. I appreciate you both coming on to talk about you know, the process. I also can really appreciate that while this is kind of a, a unique situation that you were able to extrapolate a lot of the process that you went through to something that can really apply in all departments, regardless of structure. And uh, you both did a great job on the interview today. Fran, thank, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. It's my pleasure. 
And Mark, you too. And I do want to remind everybody you've got a couple of podcasts out there or three. So definitely be looking up Mark's podcast, everybody. Obviously, we're, we're huge fans of podcasts. It yeah. <laughs> goes without yeah. saying. Well, thank you for that mention. And, and thank you both for having us here and, you know, getting to talk and share you know, some of the great work that Fran and other leaders and the team and, you know, internal process improvement people at, at Pennsylvania Hospital, in addition to the Valley Capture team, you know, I'm thankful for the collaboration there and you know, for the podcast. Today. That was Fran Strauss, Clinical Director of Perioperative Services at Penn Medicine Pennsylvania Hospital, and Mark Graben, Senior Advisor with Value Capture and an author, speaker, and podcaster just like us. As you heard just moments ago, promoting that. And Hank, I think one of the things that really stood out to me as the most important, I heard a lot of themes around the change management process and how they approached this and how they got engagement, but the focus on breaking down the silos and putting OR and SPD side by side into that process after they went live and started looking at, okay, bring it back, bring it back. Well, wait a second. Before we do that, let's work together from all perspectives on what's really broken, and maybe there's just certain things that we can work together on to get right, and then we won't have to do it, and we won't have to bring it back, and we can continue to move forward with a strategy. But that side-by-side collaboration and taking the time to do that on a big project like this, so critical. Yeah, we're all about breaking down the silos, blowing them up, chopping them down. If they're made of wood, you know, sharpen the axe and start chopping down those silos. But you're completely right, Jess. I mean, it it comes down to understanding the flow. And I know like Mark used that in a couple different contexts, but it really, I kind of hooked on when he said, you know, understanding the whole instrument process from beginning to end and really like Sometimes it takes that outside, you know, set of eyes to come in and track it. Like our sterile processing teams are not following the instruments all the way through the OR and back again. They're seeing them kind of part of the chain. It's same thing for the OR, but, you know, who's actually spending time, like you said, really seeing it go from beginning to end. That's a, a critical thing to do if you're in the middle of a big project like this or at the beginning or just in general, to see what's going on with your process. So yeah, a terrific episode and a great conversation. Really looking forward to seeing the feedback that we get and hopefully some encouragement out there for folks who are thinking about offsite reprocessing or centralization and the such. That's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support us by subscribing to Beyond Clean, yours truly, because you love us so much, on Apple, Amazon, Google Podcasts, and again, who listens to us on Stitcher? If you do, email me. If you don't, we're just going to stop pushing to Stitcher because I don't think anybody listens on there. (laughs) But no one listens on iHeartRadio, I'll tell you that for sure. Spotify or on (laughs) your favorite podcast application, you can also access bonus content, cha-ching, for certain episodes by downloading our smartphone application on iPhone, if you love me, Android, if you love Justin, And if you don't have smartphones, I guess you don't love any of us. We would certainly love and appreciate a rating and review, five stars if possible. If you hate us, please don't go give us a rating and review because your feedback is important to the show and telling everyone else how awesome this show is. If you have any questions or would like to recommend a guest or topic for the podcast, shoot us an email, info at beyondclean.net. On behalf of myself and Justin Hoolin. Thank you for listening to this episode of Beyond the Love it.